okay yes Um, let's get started. So today is the last official lecture of the course, which is on distributed system security. We do have a lecture on Wednesday, but that is going to be a guest lecture on IoT. It's still part of the class in terms of uh, material for the test and so on, but today is going to be my last lecture and then there is going to be a guest lecture. We usually have a few in the semester, this time we didn't have, so we added one at the end. Okay. So um, we are going to talk about a new topic, which is called distributed system security. Uh, we'll cover a lot of high level material here because a lot of the actual material is part of a security class, but I'm going to review that material so you can appreciate some of the distributed systems. So I'll have a little bit to say about how you can use this to implement it in applications and uh, electronic cash and payments and things of that sort. Okay? So um, when you talk about security, typically uh, there are three things that you want to worry about. You want to protect against invalid operations on your data. Right? You want to protect against unauthorized invocations of your code, and you want to protect against unauthorized users. Okay? And we are going to use uh, some combination of authentication, encryption, and things of that sort in order to get these properties in any distributed system. Okay? Now, security matters get more important in distributed systems because your application is accessible over a network. So other users can access it in addition to your own authorized user. So you have to think about security aspects as well in the uh, when you write applications that are designed to be distributed. Okay? So we'll start with authentication. Okay? So what does authentication mean? Authentication is way to prove that to the other party that you are who you claim to be. Okay? So for example, if you receive a phone call and says, okay, we are your bank, okay, and we are checking some information, can you give me your credit card number and your debit card number and PIN? Okay, That's of course quite suspicious to begin with, but if somebody calls you saying they're calling from your bank, your question should be, how do I know they're actually calling from the bank and it's not somebody else, right? Especially if they're asking for information that sounds like it's uh, going to be misused. So you need to put in a mechanism that allows you to authenticate uh, uh, yourself or one process needs to authenticate itself to another part. Okay, this is called the problem of authentication. We look at a sequence of issues and try to understand how authentication works. Okay, so, so the simplest authentication protocol, okay, we are going to use Alice and Bob as our two parties. Okay, Alice and Bob could be users, humans, or they could be processes, or one of them could be a human, the other one could be a computer. Okay? But these are two parties, and in this case, Alice is trying to prove to Bob that she is Alice. Okay? So if Alice simply sends a message saying, I'm Alice, this is equivalent of you just typing in a username into a computing system, okay? that's not going to work because the system shouldn't allow you without any additional information, but somebody else, in this case, the intruder being true, they can also send such a message. Okay. So in early systems, uh, they are used other mechanisms to validate whether the other entity is who they claim to be. So for example, you could do IP address check. Okay. You could say, is this request coming from a known IP address? If so, I will accept it as some a valid client, otherwise I won't. Okay. Now that by itself these days doesn't work okay, because you can do something called IP spoofing where you can insert a fake IP address into a packet and then make it look like the packet came from some other machine. Okay, so if you simply use IP addresses to authenticate Alice's machine or something like that, that is not going to work. Okay? So the most standard approach of course, is to have a username and a password, right? Uh, so, so this is protocol version three where Alice says to Bob, I'm Alice, here is my password. Okay? Now the problem with this approach is that 
intrude, he can intercept the password by sniffing packets because we assume that the intruder can actually look at the traffic that is going back and forth between Alice and Bob. So if you actually look at the packets that are going back and forth, you will see that you will see the string Alice and you'll see the password string in the packets. And now clearly this is not going to work anymore because your password is going over plain text. Okay. This is why early authentication protocols like Telnet and FTP are no longer used because they are not secure. They send username and password in clear text over the network. Okay. So what can we do? Okay. So clearly we should not use plain text to send in sensitive information. We are going to use encryption. Okay. We'll talk about some encryption protocols. You might have heard of many encryption protocols. We will not go into a lot of details here. But essentially, an encryption protocol allows you to take a string okay, and then apply an encryption function, and you get a different string, which does not allow you to figure out what the original context is. Okay? But for somebody who knows the encryption key, they can then take this encrypted string and recover the original message. That's the basic idea. Okay? So let's assume that you know at least that much about encryption. Okay? So now we'll see how can you use encryption to uh, do authentication. Okay, so, so let's say that the encryption algorithm uh, uses a key that is used for decryption. And this you have a secret key that is known only to Alice and Bob. We call this a symmetric key. Okay? So Alice is going to send an encrypted message to Bob, which is encrypted saying, I'm Alice. And it's encrypted using a key that only Alice and Bob know. Okay? So it follows that only Bob can de decrypt this message. Okay? and figure out what the contents of the message is and the message says I'm Alice. Okay, so in this case, Bob knows that only Alice could have sent it because only she knows the key and you have decrypted it. So you know it came from Alice because it was encrypted using the key that only the two of them. Okay, so in this case, Alice authenticated, otherwise you don't authenticate. Okay? Now even this technique is uh, has vulnerabilities. Okay? The biggest problem is it is going to suffer from what is called a replay attack or also called a playback attack. Okay? What if Trudy takes the encrypted version of this message that you take the packet exactly as it is going over the network okay, and simply hand that packet to Bob at a later time. Okay? So it's already encrypted with Alice's key. You just take that message and you, at a later time you present it to Bob saying, I am Alice and Bob will decrypt the message and say, yes, you are Alice and let you in. Okay, let you log into the system. Okay, so this is called a replay attack where you take a sequence of messages, capture them, okay, or not capture as in you make a copy of them as they're going over the network and then you replay them in the same order at a later time. And then you trick Bob to, to authenticate you. Okay, so just by using encryption will not solve the problem. Okay, so what can we do here? Okay, so your thought? Inserting identity. Identity is the username we are trying to identify. Yes, make sure I have the right? Yeah, so what, how would you do it? Yeah, whatever you want, you, are, you can check all the packets that are going on the network, and then you can spoof network addresses, you can capture packets and replay them, right? So, okay, so you can change the security key, but that requires that you have different protocol all the time, right? So while the security key is the same, you can do a replay attack. So unless you change the key every for every login, it's not going to work. Right. So, but that is the basic idea, which is that you want to change some information for every time you're trying to do authentication. That's the only way it's going to be secure. And this is, this concept is called a nonce. Okay. A nonce is essentially a once in a lifetime integer. Okay. It's an integer that's generated once in the lifetime of this application. So it will never be used again. Okay. So we are going to essentially use a nonce to help us do authentication and prevent replay attack. Okay, so here is protocol version four. Alice sends a message to Bob saying, I am Alice. This goes in plain text. Okay. So what Bob is going to do is Bob is going to issue a challenge saying, here's a nonce, prove that you are Alice. So nonce is a once in a lifetime integer that Bob has generated. 
Okay. So you say, I'm Alice. Bob says, prove it. Here's an integer. Okay. So essentially, the Alice is going to receive that integer. And then Alice is going to encrypt that integer rather than her username, encrypt the integer with the secret key that they have and present that secret key. Okay. And Bob will decrypt it and say, yes, you have the key, the, the nonsense in that encrypted message. So you must be Alice because only you have the key. Okay. And now you actually encrypted the integer I sent. Okay. So now this is not vulnerable to replay attack because the only thing that Trudy can intercept is the encrypted version of a nonce, which is never going to be used again. So this information is useless after this attempt. Okay. This is almost like a, shouldn't say almost like it's a similar concept to what one time passwords do in banking applications and other things, but more secure way to do it using encryption as opposed to using a phone or some other device to do it. Okay. So, so that's an authentication protocol that uses the concept of a nonce and it's essentially nonce is a challenge in this. Okay. Now the one issue with a nonce is it better be once in a lifetime integer. Okay. You pick it randomly. You, once you pick it, you're not supposed to pick it again because you pick the same one again and somebody has stored the previous exchange, they will know that for this end, that's the encrypted message. That's right? because the key is not key, so you can do replay. So you want to make sure the nonce is large enough in terms of number of bits that you will never reuse it over the lifetime of this application, not over the lifetime of the user. Okay? So it's a lifetime of the application. Okay, so that's one approach. Where, but that approach requires that we have a secret key that is pre-shared between Alice and Bob. Okay. And the protocol didn't tell us how you are going to generate this key and how we are going to share it between Alice and Bob. So there's another way you can do this which does not require a key to be shared in advance. Rather, what we are going to use is this notion of a public key. Okay. So public, so there are two types of encryption algorithms, symmetric and asymmetric. In the symmetric encryption algorithm, the same key is being used to recover the, de the encrypted message. So the same key is used to encrypt and the same key is used to recover. Okay. In a public key encryption algorithm, there are two keys. Okay. One is called a public key and one is called a private key. Okay. The private key only belongs to the user, only they know it's a secret. So you encrypt all messages with your private key, but to recover the encrypted message, you use a public key. Public key you can distribute to anyone you want. Okay. And it's reversible. Anything that's encrypted with the public key can only be decrypted with the private key. Anything that is encrypted with the private key can only be decrypted. So it's the same concept as a single key, except that there are two keys and you keep one key and you can publish the other key. Okay? That's the basic idea. Okay? So in this case, we'll assume that Alice has a public and a private key. Uh, only Alice knows the private key. Bob has a public and private key. Only Bob knows the private key. Okay? When you use SSH, this is the same concept. It creates a public key and a private key okay, to log it. So the authentication goes as follows. Alice sends a message to Bob saying, I'm Alice. Bob says, okay, prove it. Here's a lifetime, once in a lifetime nonce N. Okay. Alice then takes her private key, and which is now referred to as DA, okay, and then encrypts the nonce with the private key. Okay. Alice's public key is assumed to be known. Yes. So it is, it's published. So somehow Bob has gotten hold of it. So Bob can then take Alice's public key and then essentially decrypt that message and see the nonsense there. Okay. And you know that only Alice could have sent the message because it is encrypted with Alice's private key. Okay. Only Alice can generate such a message. And you can you are using the public key uh, of Alice to figure out that she is the one who encrypted it and sent it. Okay. So this is authentication using public key cryptography. Okay. Very similar things happen when you use, the students are very similar. The concept of SSH login is similar. It's not exactly the same. Doesn't use necessarily a nonce, but uh, the basic idea of using public and private keys are similar then. Okay. Now here's still a problem with this approach. Okay. Uh, so public key cryptography is actually quite secure. Okay. And if the protocol that we discussed on the previous slide uh, works as you anticipate, there is no problem, but sometimes that may not work as you anticipate. And here's a problem. Okay, so let's say that Trudy wants to impersonate Alice. So Trudy is going to send a message to Bob saying, I'm Alice. Okay, Bob is going to send a message to Alice 
saying here's a nonce proved which Trudy intercepts. So now Trudy has to generate a encrypted version of this nonce. Trudy does not have Alice's private key. She only has her private key. So but Trudy is going to take her private key, encrypt it, DT, okay, uh, and send it to Bob. Okay. Now, if Bob actually had Alice's public key, this is not going to work because you cannot decrypt a message that Trudy encrypted with somebody else's public key. However, Bob has to somehow get Alice's public key first. Okay, so Bob can actually send a message to Alice saying, send me your public key. Okay, because the public key has to come from somewhere. It's not that Bob is sitting with everybody's public key in some database, right? Because these are machines. So Bob will send a message to Alice, send me your public key, which Trudy will intercept and Trudy can then send her public key claiming that it was Alice. Bob doesn't know because Bob just gets a message from an IP address that looks like Alice's machine and there's a public key in there. So you think it came from Alice and you just use it and then you decrypt it with Trudy's public key and you find that the nonce is in there. So Trudy has tricked Bob into using a, her public key and make Bob believe that it is Alice's public key. Okay? So we just, just broke a protocol that uses public key cryptography. Now, you should realize that the problem is not with the encryption algorithm, which is secure. Okay? The problem is with what is called key distribution. How do you publish and distribute your public keys securely? If you have an insecure way to distribute a key, then the encryption algorithm is not going to work for you, okay? which is exactly what we showed here. Okay? Now, this is equivalent to you buying a big lock and putting it on your door but then keeping the key under the mat, right? So the, uh, the lock is not going to be secure if the key can be found and left in an insecure location. It's the same problem, that the key is actually distribution is insecure, not the actual protocol, okay? So you need to take any encryption algorithm and make sure that if you have to distribute keys and so on, that's also secure, okay? Now, in many cases, what happens is, um, rather than just sending a private key or know, the private, a public key in this fashion, you actually take a, a, a public key that is signed by some trusted third party, which is called a certificate. So if you send a certificate, then Bob will actually know that it is Alice's key, not some random key shows up, you believe it to be Alice's key. So, so there are ways around it to make the key distribution more secure. But this protocol as shown is not going to be uh, cutting it for us. So with that, let's now take some of these ideas and think about how we can apply them to distributed systems scenarios. Okay? The first protocol, or uh, not protocol, concept we look at is called a digital signature. Okay? So digital signature allows you to sign a message so that the other party can see that you signed it and believe that you signed it. Okay? And then you can't prove that you, or you can't claim that you didn't sign it. It's similar to signing a piece of paper, that's a signature so that the other party says, okay, you signed it. So I believe the statement that's in this paper. And then if they show you later on, you can say, okay, that's my signature. So I did sign it. You can't claim you didn't sign it. Okay? So you cannot, sender cannot repudiate messages as never being sent. And I did not send that. Receiver cannot fake a message. Okay? So Alice wants to send a message M to Bob but wants to sign this message, okay? Your signature will mean that Bob can see that Alice has signed it, okay? What is one way to do it, okay? Bob can uh, simply ask, uh, uh, Bob can simply take his private key and encrypt the entire message, okay? Encrypting a message with your private key is like signing it because only you can do this operation. Nobody else can do the operation. And then you can present this encrypted message to the other party who can now use your public key and decrypt it and say, yes, you must have signed this message. Okay. So encrypting a message is equivalent to signing the message in this protocol. Okay. So you cannot claim you didn't do it because only you have your private key and somebody else can verify your signature by using your public key and decrypting saying, yes, you signed this message. Okay. And you cannot deny having sent M because you signed it with your public. So here we are using nothing but plain encryption as a signature. You're just encrypting a message with a key that only you have. 
and you're sending it and that's like signing it, okay? Now, that's actually not an efficient way to do it or necessary the, the way it's done. This is because if you use public key cryptography, the, it's a very large key. If you take an arbitrary document, let's say it's a PDF file and you try to sign it, it's going to be very computationally expensive to encrypt and decrypt it because the keys are large and it's going to be extremely slow to encrypt very large documents. Okay? So you don't want to use very large keys, which are public and private keys, necessarily to encrypt documents as a way to sign them. So we need a more efficient approach that gives us similar properties. Okay? And this is where we are going to use the concept of a message digest. Okay? So what is the message digest? The message digest is essentially a, a shorter string that is a representation of the original document. Okay? So we are going to use a hash function to, uh, to basically uh, compute digests of messages. Okay? So we have a hash function H okay? that can take any arbitrary length string, which is a bit byte string or any arbitrary document and convert it to a fixed length hash. It could be a 64 bit hash or a 64 byte hash. So you can take any, it could be a PDF file. It could be some large document you wrote. First is you apply the hash function and the hash function is not secret. It's just a standard hash function. It's going to give you a fixed length hash value. Okay? Then you're going to actually digitally sign the hash value, not the document. You're going to sign H of M, where M is the message and H of M is the hash of the message. Okay? And then you're going to send the message and you're going to send the signed hash. The signed hash in this case is the signature, okay? So in the previous case, we just encrypted the entire message. In this case, you're only encrypting with the private key, the hash of the message, that's the signature, okay? So now if Bob wants to verify this, what Bob will do is Bob will take the message and take a hash of the message, okay? And then Bob will take Alice's public key and extract the hash and compare them. If the message, the two match, it tells you the message was not altered by somebody else. Because the message is being sent unencrypted. And you also know that this is the message that Alice signed because it is actually the same hash in both cases. Okay, and the hash is encrypted by Alice, which has a signature in it. Okay, so, so that is typically how you sign. So this is how you will actually sign documents. Okay, you will take a hash of the document and you'll sign that hash. And that is how you compute. Uh, not compute, rather verify that you sign the message. Okay? Now doing it this way requires to us to have certain properties of this hash function. Okay? Your hash function causes collision. There are two documents that generate the same hash. Okay? You sign one document, somebody can use the other document and claim that you signed that document because generating the same hash. Okay? So you want hash function that will have low collision probability. Every hash function is going to have collision probability because you're taking an arbitrary length string and finding a fixed length hash string. So there will be multiple strings that give you the same hash value by definition. You can't have a unique hash for every string because then that string can't be smaller, the hash can't be smaller than the original string by definition, okay? But it should be hard for you to actually find two messages X and Y that generate the same hash or given a hash, uh, given a message Y, it should be, or rather given a digest X, which you should not be able to generate some arbitrary message that gives you the same hash value, okay? So if you have both of those properties, then this is going to be a good way to have digital signatures. Any questions? Yes, hash functions are one way. You can't get a hash value and regenerate the message that will give you a way to then generate multiple messages because each hash function, there will be many messages that hash into that by definition because it's collision. Okay, so hashing is always one way. Encryption is reversible. Okay. Is this clear? Any questions here? Are you monitoring Piazza? Yes. Sir. Okay. Okay. Good. So the, what kind of hash functions can you use? Uh, maybe two, one or two decades ago, there was one called message digest five, MD five. That was a popular way to do this, but it was soon broken into, which means you could run, launch brute force attacks to violate some of these properties that I mentioned here, right? So then uh, you basically came up with a better hash function. So there's one called SHA hashes. 
Okay, so uh, SHA stands for secure hash algorithm. Okay, so it is a family of hash function. Uh, and then uh, the, the family differs in how large the hash value is. SHA-1 generates 160-bit hashes. SHA-512 generates 512 uh, uh, bit hashes and so on and so forth. Okay? The larger the hash, the more expensive it is to compute, but the more secure it is because the probability of collision is less, the probability of launching brute force attacks is less and so on. Okay? So the, the, right now, uh, if you use any um, uh, technique that requires secure hashing, you're going to use one from the SHA family. And typically it's going to be 512 or 256 bits. Okay, so what I'm going to do next is uh, talk a little bit about how do you do symmetric key exchange, okay? How are we going to use public key cryptography to generate a key that two entities can use for encrypted communication? So, so what this means is for each session, we need to generate a key, okay? For Alice and Bob want to communicate, they need a key for that communication. How do they generate it and how do they get it? The first one, okay, first technique uses a, a third party, which we will call a key distribution center or a KDC. Okay? So both Alice and Bob will go to the KDC and say, generate a key for us. Okay? And the KDC will generate a key and send it. So in this case, we are going to essentially still use public key cryptography, but that is only to distribute the keys. Once the keys are distributed, you use a symmetric encryption algorithm for actual communication. Okay? So, so here is Alice. Alice sends a message to the KDC saying, I'm Alice. I want to communicate with Bob, generate a key for us. Okay? So the KDC is going to generate a session key, to, which is represented as KAB. This is a session key for Alice and Bob to communicate. And that session key is sent to Alice using Alice's uh, uh, public key, uh, sorry, uh, encrypted using Alice's public key, and sent to Bob using Bob's public key. So only Alice and Bob can decrypt that message. Okay, so, so that's one way you can do it. The other way you can do it is you have a pre-shared key with the KDC that only you and the KDC know. So the KDC encrypts it with your secret key. So you have to use one of two mechanisms so that only Alice and Bob can decrypt the session key. If you have somebody who gets hold of that session key, they can decrypt every message that Alice and Bob send. So the se session key has to be distributed securely. So, so it's a simple protocol. So you ask a third party to generate the key for you and then you send the encrypted version of the key. Once Alice and Bob have the key, they can then use that key to directly communicate with one another okay, using that session key. Any questions here? Okay, the question is can Trudy intercept the key? Trudy can get hold of these messages. Okay, but Trudy can't decrypt those messages, right? So yes, all of these messages can be encrypted. The point is to show that they're secure even after you intercept the message, right? So suppose that Trudy just get hold of, gets hold of this message. Okay, it's encrypted with the key that only Alice and the KDC know. So Trudy cannot decrypt it and get the key, right? It's not, so key is sent encrypted. Key is not sent plain text. Okay. So here is how you would do this with, uh, uh, with using public key cryptography and no third party, just Alice and Bob send messages to generate a session key, okay? So Alice is going to send a message to, Bo so Alice knows Bob's public key, Bob knows Alice's public key, public keys are known. So Alice is first going to generate, saying I'm Alice, here's a nonce, okay? And this is now encrypted with Bob's public key and sent to Bob. Only Bob can extract the nonce because only Bob has the private key to get it. Okay? So Bob gets that nonce, generates a second nonce, so RB, okay? and then generates a session key and then sends all of all three pieces of information. So here's your nonce that I'm sending back. Here's a new nonce I generated, so you have to send it back. Here's a key that we should use for our, say, for our session. All three pieces of information are encrypted with Alice's public key and sent it. Only Alice can extract this. So once Alice does this, she say, sees that the nonce has come back. So she knows that it is for this session. She gets a new nonce. Okay? And then she's going to take the session key, encrypt the nonce and send it back. Right? 
So Bob can use the session key to get that nonsense and say, okay, we are now authenticated and we have also generated as a session key. Okay, so you're doing authentication and you're generating a session key all in one step. Okay, so you just like logging in and getting a session key for encrypted communication. Questions on this? Okay. So as I already mentioned, public keys are supposed to be public. So everybody needs to know what your public key is, but then how do you distribute it to somebody? Okay. First time you send it, you can't encrypt it with anything because you are just sending it. You can publish it on your website, for example, saying, here's my public key if you want to communicate with me. But all of these are subject to a, what are called man in the middle or person in the middle attack where an intruder can get hold of your public key and replace it with some other public key to trick somebody else in communicate from communicating with you. Okay. So, and I, we, show, we saw that earlier when we were doing authentication, the question is, how do we prevent that from happening? Okay. The way you're going to prevent this is using this notion of a certificate. Okay. So this is how you are going to distribute your public key. But when somebody gets a public key, it's not just an integer because keys are all integers. Okay. So the key will actually have your name attached to it. Okay. And that name is going to be signed by a trusted third party. So, which is called a certification authority. So if you want to distribute your public key securely, you should first get a certificate for that key and then present that certificate. The certificate will have your name saying, this key has been issued to such and such. It could be a human, it could be a machine. A okay, name it could be because the parties could be either actual users or they could be machines, but it'll have either the machine name or the person name, it will have the public key, and all of that is going to be signed by the certification authorities public key, or sorry, private key. So certification authority certifies that this certificate is genuine. Okay? And it's assumed that certification authorities are well-known entities. Uh, everybody has their public key to begin with. Okay? So if you are provided a certificate, you just decrypt it with the encryption authorities public key and verify that the public key inside the certificate actually belongs to Alice or belongs to Bob or is a public key of a certain web server that you're communicating with and so on. Okay. So this allows you to use a trusted third party, which is called a certification authority. Okay. This is how all browsers are actually going to use HTTPS. Whenever they connect to a machine, the machine sends a certificate. First thing you verify is, is the certificate valid? Is the machine, the actual machine I need? Okay, and then the way the browser verifies this is browser has built in support for several no well-known certification authorities, which means that their public keys are pre-stored in the browser app when the browser app was built. So if any of the well-known certification authorities issued that certificate, they can immediately decrypt it and see. Okay? Or sometimes you may have a certificate that's signed by somebody the browser doesn't know. This is when you get a certificate warning. Maybe you've seen that before. Will say I cannot validate the certificate. Should we proceed or not, or something like that? And so, but most cases, if you have well-known certificate uh, certification authorities, you can validate the certificate. Okay. So, any questions on this? Okay. So, certificates are what is used today as the means to disseminate public keys in a secure way. You should not typically put an uh, integer string on your website saying, here is my, because people put their PGP keys and so on on their website. That's not secure because somebody could intercept it, somebody could modify it, and you don't know whether the string has been modified and so on. A better way is to get a certificate on your name, which has your public key in it, and then put a certificate. A certificate, if it's altered, it cannot be decrypted. So if, so if, it, if it gets decrypted successfully, somebody can verify that it is your public key, not somebody else's that you insert it for a person in the middle attack. Okay, so with that, we can now talk about applications. We kind of did so authentication, I alluded to encryption, we didn't get into encryption. Uh, we looked at sharing public keys and so on. Uh, now we can actually look at how to apply this in networks and distributed systems. Okay, so first thing is when you have lar <coughs> large scale enterprises that use different applications. Okay, security is a big problem okay, because there are many ways 
intruders can get in. So you, if you look at a typical enterprise, it's going to use a multiple layered approach to secure its machines, the applications and so on. So you will have things called firewalls that actually check which packets are let in or let out. You have deep packet inspection techniques that look inside packets to see is there a virus in this, in this packet. Uh, there will be virus scanners that are on emails that are coming in. You will have virtual LANs that allow you to limit your communication. You will have uh, password servers that only allow authenticated machines to get on the network. You will have Wi-Fi password to secure your Wi-Fi. You will have VPN to secure your traffic. You will use SSL certificates to encrypt or authenticate yourself. Okay? So it's a long list of things and the list keeps going on actually. It doesn't end there. Uh, you will have websites that uses SSL. You will have challenge response authentication, one-time passwords, two-factor authentications that you see even now when you log into your Gmail and so on, where the phone gets a password and then the thing goes on and on. So what this says is security is a difficult problem to address. There is no one approach if you use that says everything is set because there are many ways intruders can attack your system. So you need a multiple layered approach where you use lots of different security techniques that work together to secure your network, your applications and data. Okay? Now in this class, we don't have time to examine all of this because you have to take a class on computer security to go through it. But I'm going to take a couple of these things and we'll talk about them in a little more detail. Okay, but uh, with that, let's first talk about firewalls. Okay? So I presume you encountered firewalls. If you did the lab, I think the first thing you see is when you have a, a machine on the cloud, you bring it up, it's actually firewall. You can't access it from the outside. So you have to first do something to allow access to it. Okay, so what does a firewall do? A firewall is a machine that sits at the, uh, at the entry point of your network that takes every packet that's going in or out and matches it to a set of rules. The rules say what should be done with the packet. There are typically two types of rules, allow and deny. Allow rule says that let the packet go through. Deny says this is not allowed, just kill the packet. Okay? So typically if you want to block um, access to a machine from the outside, so you can say here's an IP, internal IP address or it could be some IP address to the machine. Any packets that are coming to this machine from the outside, deny. Okay? That means that somebody from the outside cannot access the machine. Then you can say, hey, but I want to just access port 80 on that machine to access the web server. So you can say, deny all packets except port 80 traffic to this machine. So you can add that rule in the firewall and then for that machine and that port, those packets will be letting, but others, others will not. So you can keep adding different types of rules to your firewall that allow or deny various uh, operations or various types of packets. And that is going to be your first level of defense that says, I won't even let the packets of some intruder, intruding machine get in. I will only allow what I think are safe machines to access uh, resources inside my network. Okay? You can have firewall rules for packets going out also. It's not just one way. You can say, I don't allow web browsing from uh, my inside my network. Okay? or I'm not going to disallow, I'm going to blacklist these websites so you cannot access them from inside my uh, enterprise network and so on. So same thing will happen. You will not be allowed to access those machines. Okay. So typically uh, on that slide actually had more than one entity. So I'm going to talk about oh, those boxes. A firewall essentially is one that does what is called packet filtering. Every packet, network packet, a, a TCP IP packet, or an IP packet technically, is going to be matched against a fire uh, set of rules. And if the rule, there's a matching rule, we apply that rule. Okay? Then there are higher level firewalls, which are called application gateways. Okay? Application gateways can actually, they don't just look at the source address and the source port number, destination address, destination port number, and make a decision. They can actually do more sophisticated things. Okay? So for example, they can look inside packets or they can say, um, here is what I should do with this packet. I should send it to this machine okay, and things of that sort. So you can have uh, what are called application level gateways, which are machines that are going to intercept 
specific types of application packets and do certain things with it. So, uh, so email can be sent to an email server, all incoming email. All web traffic can be sent to another server. So you can do this at an application level. Okay, this is also where you have what are called deep packet inspection firewalls or DPI firewalls. Okay, they actually look inside the packet to find signatures saying here, I know these types of viruses, do I see a matching signature of a virus? If so, you'll drop the packet. Okay. Packet firewalls only look at IP address information. They're not looking at the content, they're looking at header. Okay, when you start looking at the content, you get these deep packet inspection or application level uh, gateways or fire, uh, firewalls. Okay, so next I'm going to uh, explain how using some of the concepts we looked at earlier in this class, can we make email secure? Okay, the first thing is should be clear if you're sending an email, by default, there's no security. Right? The email is going unencrypted, so anyone can read that email. The email is easily spoofed. This is why you get a lot of junk mail claiming it come, came from somebody. You can just replace the from address and you will think it mail came from somebody. And so there are all kinds of problems with email. Okay. So how can you make it secure? So we'll say there are four requirements if you want to make it secure. First one is secrecy. Secrecy means no, somebody else should not be able to read your email. It should only be read by the intended recipient. Okay. Second is sender authentication. The recipient should be able to verify you sent the message, not somebody else claiming to be you. Okay. Third is message integrity. Message integrity says that somebody should not alter your message. Right. So you said, yes, I'll give you an extension for lab two, and then somebody maliciously says, puts the word not, and then you say, I will not give you an extension. Right. So then that doesn't make you happy if somebody can do something like this. Right. So, so that's message integrity. Receiver authentication says that only the receiver should be able to read the message, nobody else. Right? Um, so how do we do all of this? We'll build it one step at a time. So we know how to do secrecy already. Okay? Secrecy is going to require us to encrypt the email, because emails do unencrypted. Right? So we are going to, we could use public keys to do this, but public keys are long, they're expensive they're, uh, to use. So what we will do, if Alice wants to send a message to Bob, Alice will first generate a random symmetric key K. Okay. Alice will encrypt that email message M with this K. Okay. And now you have to send. So then Alice will take the key and she will encrypt it with Bob's public key, okay, which is known. And what you send as your message is the encrypted version of the message encrypted with the key K and the key K itself encrypted with Bob's public key. So now Bob can, only Bob can extract this key first thing, but only Bob has the private key. Okay, no one else can extract the key K. Okay. Without extracting this key, you cannot decrypt the message. Okay, so this follows that only Bob can extract the key and decrypt the message. So no one else can read the message or get hold of the key. Okay, it's a very simple way to encrypt messages without using very long keys. If you are using a shorter key and you're sending the key itself in an encrypted. You could have, of course, taken Bob's public key and encrypted that entire message and sent it. Okay, but that key is very long and it's very expensive to decrypt and encrypt it because longer keys are more computationally expensive. So, you're using a cheaper method, which is a shorter key to encrypt it and then send that key. Okay. Okay, so that is going to give us the first of the two things. Okay, so, now we want to add authentication and integrity without secrecy. Okay, so what can we do here? Alice can use the hash idea. So you can take a hashing function H, okay, which could be SHA, should not be MD5, MD5 is not secure. It says H can be MD5, that's not right. It should be SHA, some family of SHA. Okay, so you will take the message and find its hash. Okay? Then you are going to digitally sign that hash. Okay? So Alice is going to take her public key and sign the hash. Okay? And then Alice sends the message M, in this case it's unencrypted, and she sends the signature. Okay. So Bob can check that Alice has signed the message, but Bob can take M, the hashing function is known, so Bob recomputes H, okay, H of M. Bob can take Alice's public key and get the H of M that has come with the message and compare. The two match, you know that the signature is valid. Okay. This also ensures that M cannot be altered in transit. If M gets changed and this becomes M prime, 
the hashes won't match. So you know that that is not the message Alice sent because the hash is different. Right? So not only can you validate that Alice sent the message, you can also check integrity, which is no one has changed the message. Okay? But this is not secure because you're sending the messages unencrypted. Okay? So you have to then combine the previous two steps to get it all. Okay? So which is all here. The first is you get a message M, you compute a hash, you sign the hash with the public key. Okay? Then you take the message and the hash and you get another message M prime, which is the concatenation of those two message. Okay? Then you are going to generate your secret key K. You're going to encrypt all of this, the message and the signature get encrypted. So that is essentially now K of M prime. You take the key, you encrypt it with Bob's public key sender. So now I send the key, I send the encrypted message, I sent uh, the hash of that message. Okay, so M prime has both the message and the hash. So uh, this is how Bob can now extract the key and get this message M prime that has the message and the hash, can compute the hash, compare them and then validate it. Okay. So this is going to give us all of the properties we want. Okay. So that is essentially what PGP will do to send secure email. Yes. Yeah, M prime, so question is M prime, the concatenation is like you add a mail signature to your message, right? You write a message, your signature gets added. It's the same thing, you write a message, at the end, that encrypted string, which is a signature gets. It's not a textual string, which has your name and your email or something. It is an encrypted string, but yes. Okay, any questions here? Okay, so next we are going to talk about SSL. Okay, this is something you probably about. So HTTP communication by default is also not secure because HTTP is sending messages over TCP. So everything that is in your HTTP message can be read, right? So if you're sending HTTP messages to your bank, all the bank information of your account will be in that HTTP reply. It will all be something that somebody can read. So you don't want HTTP traffic to go unencrypted, which is why you can use a concept called a secure sockets layer, SSL. So this just takes any vanilla network sockets and you all know what sockets do because it looked at this in the course and you add an encryption library on top. So when you try to do a send on the socket, the socket library will first encrypt it for you, send it. And then at the other end, the socket library will decrypt it. So the application is not doing anything. Application is simply doing send and receive, but the library actually has built in encryption. So this is a secure version of socket. It's like the sockets you saw, but it's a more secure version. Okay. So this is one way you can essentially think of SSL, but when it is used with the concept of HTTP, here is how it will work. Okay. HTTP can be made more secure by using HTTPS. S stands for secure, which means that it is using SSL to communicate. Okay. So now to do for this encrypted communication, you need to generate the key. Right. So here is how it will work. Your browser will contact the server saying, I need to set up a HTTPS connection, not an HTTP connection. Okay. The browser will then say, I support some SSL version two or three or whatever it may be. Okay. The server is first going to say, here is my certificate, here's my public key. Okay. Because you don't know, you can contact a random server because the user wants to connect. Never, browser may never have contact. The first thing server says is, here is my certificate. Okay. Certificate has the name of the server, it has the public key of the server. It is signed by a trusted certification authority. So the browser will validate this machine is actually the machine I want to contact and this is the public key of the machine and extract that public key. So now the browser has the server public key which it didn't have before. Okay? So you use the certification authority to decrypt it. So you got a, a public key of the machine. So browser then generates a session key K. Okay? And then it will encrypt it with the public key it just got in the certificate. And then it will send that off to the server saying, here's the key we are going to use from now on. Okay. And you're essentially going to say, all of these further messages will be encrypted. Here is the key. So the key is actually sent encrypted with the public key. So only the server can decrypt. Okay. So you shared the key. Now the keys at both ends, you can then use the key to communicate. Okay. So this is essentially what will happen in the SSL library layer. Okay. HTTP itself won't do this but the SSL version of the library will do this for you, okay?
questions on this? Yes. Okay, question is, is this key stored in the cookie of the client? It will not be stored in the cookie of the client. It's a session key, it's only kept in memory. If you keep it on disk, then somebody can read it, obviously. Right? So every time you connect, you will redo this because this is done for each socket, right? So you set up a new socket connection, you will redo this and get another session key. So it's tied to a particular socket connection. As soon as you turn on the socket connection, it's gone. Right? So it is essentially, that is why it's called secure sockets, like HTTPS over a socket. Right? So once that connection closes, the key is no longer useful. Okay. So that's our secure socket layer. Yeah. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about electronic payment systems. Okay. So now we will see how can we use all of these concepts to, to, to do electronic payments. So this is not cryptocurrency. Yeah, we will talk a little bit about that at the very end. All this is saying is rather than using paper cash, how can we use some electronic version of money, which is not still cryptographic. It's simply saying, I want to use it secure. Yeah. So cash does not have any security in that if somebody steals the money, it's gone, you can't trace it and so on. Okay. So now normally banks are going to work uh, with other types of ways to make payments. The simplest one is a check, right? So you basically then, uh, here is how the check works. You basically write a check, you give it to the payee. The payee gives it to deposits into their bank and their bank and your bank have something called a settlement process where the check is sent to your bank for collection. Your bank will validate your signature and send the payment. Once it comes into the payee's bank, the payee has access to it. Okay? Now this is done using paper route. There's no electronics, anything here, uh, but uh, that is how checks work, right? Now, uh, so that the first one was cash, by the way. So payer goes and withdraws cash from their bank, gives cash to the pay. Pay can, of course, spend it or deposit into their bank. Less secure check, little better. You're not using actual uh, cash. Okay. Then credit cards are done similarly. The bank issues a credit card. Okay. So you have present that to the merchant. The pay. merchant contacts the bank saying, I want to authorize so much money. There's some settlement. Usually there is a uh, some other entity like MasterCard or Visa that's present here, not shown in this case, but essentially that will authorize the transaction and then the payer's bank, or it could be a credit card company, but let's assume it's a bank, will then generate a statement and essentially the payer has to pay and then it gets paid to the uh, the, uh, the merchant. Okay? So this is a similar settlement process that involves collecting the credit card payments and then settling it with the bank. So, so that's credit card. So none of this uses any encryption. This is how you have actually done payments with banks and so on. Okay? So how can we now replicate some of this with encryption, but give some nice properties? Okay? So the first concept is called electronic cash. Okay? It's a way to securely have money. Okay? This is not used currently, but there are now uh, proposals to actually have electronic version of currencies like uh, a normal currency, not cryptocurrency, they might start using some of this. But here is the basic idea. If you want to have the properties of cash, okay, checks and credit cards are not uh, anonymous, right? If you go write a check to somebody, they have some information about your name is on the check. You basically present a credit card, your name is on the credit card. But if you go and pay in cash, whoever you're paying to doesn't actually know who you are unless you identify yourself. The cash itself doesn't identify. Okay? So how can you have electronic payment that act preserves the anonymity of cash? Okay? So the way we are going to do this is we are going to construct an electronic coin okay? and we are going to essentially issue that coin so that you can make payment with that coin, but the coin doesn't have your name, but yet the other party can validate that it's valid money. So here's how you'll do it. You'll generate a coin. I mean, you are the bank, whoever, somebody can generate the coin. And first thing is you're going to blind, the coin will have a unique serial number. You're going to blind it. Okay, this is like, I uh, take a cash and I put it in a piece of envelope so you don't know what the, the number on the the, uh, the cash is, uh, the, the dollar bill is. Okay. So I take the blinded version and I send it to the bank. The bank will sign it saying, I sign this $10 coin because it is authentic. Okay? So then it 
comes back to you, then you unblind it saying, this is token number or $10 coin with this sequence number. Here's a signature from the bank. And because the bank has signed this as authentic uh, because you withdrew that money. Okay, then you can go and send it to the receiver uh, saying he has a payment. Okay? The receiver has to first authenticate that this actually is valid. I mean, you're not giving them actual cash, you're giving them some uh, number and a signature. So they will contact the bank and validate saying, here is this number, here's a signature, is it valid? Okay? So the bank will first check that they signed it, the signature is valid. Okay? Second thing that the bank can check in this case is that the money was not already spent. Okay? Because there's nothing that prevents this payer from this coin is just a string. I can present the same coin to two merchants. Okay, I can just try to spend the same money again. So the bank shouldn't validate the same coin over and over again. You can only spend it once, right? So, so once you validate it, the bank will assume it's spent. So if somebody you try to use the same money somewhere else, the bank will say it's not valid. It's already been spent. Right? So your bank is going to use that signature and figure this out. Now the interesting thing here is the bank doesn't know who is spending. Because you sent a blinded coin, and so the bank is not tracking, essentially, the, the identifying that such and such user has this coin. They only know they issued a coin with this number, okay, and then you can spend it once, but you don't know who has that coin. So that's the part that makes it somewhat anonymous. Okay. So, so we didn't look at the encryption and all of that, but you get the general idea from signatures and so on. Okay. This was a nice proposal, but never went anywhere, right? because it's actually is not used in set cryptocurrencies have taken over. Okay. But uh, uh, th this doesn't actually require lots of what you need in the crypto world. The bank would not need to authorize the payer. No, the payer will essentially withdraw the money and then generate the coin. So it's like saying, okay, give me $10 or something like that, or here's a coin. Right, so somehow the bank will have to sign it. You understand that, right? Because you, so in that sense, there is an account with the bank. So you can, but the bank is not associating the number of the coin they gave. They just say, okay, you withdrew ten dollars. I'm going to sign this ten dollar bill. For, I don't know the number, but I sign this ten dollar bill saying it's authentic and give it to you. Now the bank knows you withdrew ten dollars, but the bank doesn't know which coin number is yours. So when you spend it, they don't know who spent the money. They just know who withdrew the money, right? So that's basically what it is. Okay. So last is we are going to just talk a little bit about Bitcoin and then we are going to end. Okay, so uh, clearly that electronic payments uh, that we had talked about in the previous slide is a good technique, but didn't really go very far. But instead what has taken over is this P2P electronic decentralized currencies which are called cryptocurrency there are many different families of it the most popular one you probably heard of is called bitcoin as based on an open source crypto protocol okay that was uh, uh, that has this notion of proof of work and things of that sort. okay so so the, we will look at the basis for bitcoin which are blo blockchains and distributed ledgers but by and large the way this works is um, uh, the currency in Bitcoin is generated by the participants in the Bitcoin network. Okay? So you need it's peer to peer protocol. You need peers to allow you to validate transactions and do some work for the network. And you get a reward for doing this work to keep track of who is transferred money to who else. All these transactions have to be logged in some public database called a blockchain. And you want peers to participate. So the reward for the peers to participate is every once in a while it will generate a new coin and it reward. So now you actually generate cash for our uh, Bitcoin, shouldn't say cash, generate new Bitcoin for participating in the network. Okay? So uh, you have to expand resources to generate a coin. The number of coins that get generated decreases exponentially. So over time, more and more work has to be generated to generate the next coin. Okay. This is why from an environmental perspective, it's not sound because there are lots of Bitcoin miners that are trying to participate to mint money. They think that just by essentially doing computation, I can generate money. But over time, more work has to be generated done to generate one unit of money. And that means you're spending a lot of energy to do this. But putting that aside, 
uh, how does Bitcoin itself work? So essentially, it uses the concept of a digital signature to pay someone. Okay, so and you have a distributed ledger called a blockchain to record all the transactions. So I'm going to show you some pictures to oh, wrong slide. Uh, show you some pictures to uh, explain how all of that works. Okay? So at the basis of all these cryptocurrencies is called blockchain. Blockchains have nothing to do with cryptocurrencies. They are just a distributed public database. Okay? So which means that this is a database where every transaction that is recorded is publicly visible. Because think of it as a database where anybody can go and look at what entries are in the database, when the entries were made and validated. Okay? So the idea is that every transaction, if you pay somebody uh, one dollar or one uh, cryptocurrency unit, it is going to be recorded saying such and such person gives such and such other person this. Okay, now you don't actually record identities of people, but you record public keys saying this public key transferred this money to some other public key. You may not know the true owner of the public key, but every transaction is recorded. So you know which public key has how much money in the network. Okay? So it's a public database. Okay? So that is a distributed ledger. Okay? So it's a ledger in that a ledger is basically just a log of transactions. So you have a log that's in your database and it's completely public. Okay? So the blockchains are at the heart of a lot of these things. Now, blockchains have a lot of applicability beyond cryptocurrencies. Because any place where you need a public record of something that anyone can go and verify, can be a use case for a blockchain. Okay? Here's an example, stock register, stock transaction. So there's stock trading. Right? So you can record how the transaction, who bought what stock, all of that can be recorded. In the, so that if there is any dispute, you can go and check the transaction. Okay? Land purchases. Most cases, land purchases are public record. You can actually go and register the land. Somebody can go and check who owns this land when it was bought. All of that is public. Okay? You can actually use blockchain to store this information. Okay, marriage certificates, right? So lots of things like the smart contracts that you want to make public and so on. So these are all use cases for blockchains, but the most common one is actually using it for recording crypto transactions and who paid how much to who else. Okay. So the basic idea in blockchain is you take any transaction, contract, stock purchase, land purchase, and you sign it with a private key saying, I did this transaction. Okay? And then you insert it in the ledger. So now it has become public record. Okay? So a ledger will have a set of blocks. Each block has a set of transactions saying, this happened, this happened, this happened. So that's why the block, the block has multiple transactions. Once you commit it, it's basically finalized. Okay? So it's massively duplicated. So essentially it's shared using P2P file transfer protocols. Okay? And there are special nodes to append these blocks to the global transaction record. Okay, so every time a new block is generated, you ask a peer saying, can you append it to the network? So peers do some work and append, and whoever actually successfully appends, essentially eventually starts getting the Bitcoin. In, in Bitcoin case, you're using the blockchain to actually reward the miners, but blockchain doesn't have the concept of mining. It's just public database. You don't need to have miners to append. You can use your own machine to happen okay? but this is how it is done in the context of cryptocurrencies there are these special nodes called miners who will keep appending blocks and transactions to their ledger okay? so the networks also perform validation and clearing and then you do settlement using consensus okay so there is a distributed consensus protocol as well we have studied consensus already that decide that we all agree that we want to commit this transaction you don't want one peer to start appending some transactions because it could be malicious. It could start putting bad data. So you want a consensus protocol to ensure that you can't attack the network and so on and put bad transactions. Okay. So it has distributed consensus protocol. It has digital signatures. So a lot of the concepts we talked about, they all come together in this concept of a distributed ledger. Here are some pictures of how a blockchain works. So here is essentially a transaction that you want to record in your blockchain. First, you're going to encrypt it with your public key. Perhaps the other party also signs it if it's a contract and so on. And then you send it to a validation network. So the validation network is essentially a lot of peers 
that are going to first check that the transaction is legitimate and so on. And then you are going to construct a block. Okay. And then that block is eventually going to be appended to your global blockchain and then it becomes part of that public record. Right? So, so you will essentially have transactions flowing in and there's validation happening consensus to say these are the transactions we should commit. Once it's committed, it becomes part of the network and later on you can go and check that this was actually done and so on. Okay. Lots of details of how each step is done, we will gloss over in this case, I'm not going to go into, but this is at a very high level um, how blockchains are going to work. Okay, so now if you can use this your question. Good question. What is it the concept of blockchain come up with Bitcoin or was it separate? So in some sense, Bitcoin made so blockchains were a separate concept, right? The notion of a distributed database that's public was not specific to Bitcoin. What Bitcoin did is it made it practical for somebody to actually participate in this network. Because you could have said, I, I am a company. I, I have 100 machines that are all going to together store my blockchain and that's it. Right? So that's not, so even in that case, you're offering a service, but the company controls it. What the Bitcoin philosophy was, this should be decentralized. Nobody should be able to control what goes in, which means that you want individuals or any interested party from participating, but not controlling. So the way you do this is to incentivize them. Why should I participate in a peer-to-peer -peer network? What do I get, right? So the way you participate is you have the notion of a reward. If you participate, you might get a, some, a Bitcoin at the end of this, right? So you will actually earn money for participating. So the, they put in this incentive mechanism that made it practical and made people incentivized to participate in a network that implements a distributed ledger. Okay? So that is how they took an idea and made it practical. Now there are other cryptocurrencies where you have, you don't next actually need a public network. You can have an organization managing this network and things of that sort, right? So, so and, and there are many versions of blockchains as well. Not all of them depend on P2P because it is just a way you make a transaction record public. We don't have to have peers to do this. You can have government run this for you. You can have some other entity run this for you. So there are many ways to implement blockchains. There are many ways to take a blockchain and incentivize users to participate. So Bitcoin's uh, 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 key contribution was it made blockchains a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, system that incentivize people from joining. So that is how uh, you should look at it. Okay, so last thing I want to say is about Bitcoin. So assuming you have blockchains, so here is how Bitcoins are going to. So now you assume that there are users okay, who hold Bitcoins, which is cryptocurrencies and they keep them in their wallet. So to now to, if I want to pay somebody, Okay, I have to take some Bitcoin, which has maybe a tra unique transaction number. I have to transfer ownership. So currently I own this. So the way I make payment is I transfer ownership of this currency to somebody else. Okay, and the way we are going to do this is we are going to record this transfer as a public record. Okay? Now note that although you are recording that A has transferred this money to B, you are not actually putting A and B's identity in it. You are using public keys which may be anonymous. So you don't actually know who owns things. We just know that there are these public keys that are transferring money from one entity to the other. But here is essentially the idea. Alice and Bob want to conduct a transaction. You use their cryptographic keys. And then you essentially says, I'm going to transfer one Bitcoin from Alice wants to do this to Bob. Now it's yours. So then you take this transaction and you put it in the blockchain. And now Bob can actually hold that Bitcoin in his wallet and be the legitimate owner because it's recorded that Bob's public key is the owner of that Bitcoin. So each coin is a unique owner and the ownership is recorded in the ledger. And all transactions are public even though we don't actually know the real owners because all of these are anonymized public keys. Okay? So this is how you will use uh, blockchains to track your transactions. Okay? So it is anonymous in the sense you don't know the actual owners yet all the transactions are public. So that's the concept of Bitcoin. Any questions?
is there anything on there okay all right so we are going to run out of time but we'll end it few minutes early today so that's all we have uh, that's actually the end of the class uh, for today but also the last lecture that i am going to deliver the next lecture there is going to be a lecture on wednesday but it's a guest lecture it's on iot there's still an interesting topic but i am not here on wednesday so somebody else is going to give a guest lecture on that topic okay so with that let's stop here and